and thanks to NumFocus for sponsoring these. Uh, just by quick way of intro, well, today we're going to talk about Dask. This is going to be a, an introduction to, to Dask. Let me go ahead and start. Let me make these slides a little bigger. I want to focus on exploratory data analysis and machine learning. Uh, the reason why I talk about Dask, I work at a Dask company. I work at uh, Coiled, which was founded by the creator of Dask, Matt Rockland. And I, pr I previously worked with him and some others at Anaconda, uh, which is known for the Anaconda distribution of Python and the Conda package manager, which shared uh, an office with NumFocus, which was really cool. Um, so today, I, I hope you, if you're here for Dask, you're in the right spot. If you're here for Parallel Python, you're in the right spot. If you're here for uh, data frames that you want to make, you want to go bigger on, or like, hey, I, I'd like, I'd like to read in more data in this data frame, do stuff like that. You're in the right spot. Um, and if you're here for scikit-learn estimators, you'd like to scale, you're also in the right spot. Um, there are three things I think we can accomplish hopefully over the next hour or so. I want to build kind of fundamentally to introduce you best to Dask and to parallel and distributed Python in general. We need to build a little bit of intuition, and I, I hope I have some kind of germane code samples that will, that will uh, ran this home. Um, I also, from feedback from previous talks, instead of just showing bashing you over the head with Dask examples, I want to show you some use cases. Uh, one of my, you know, being privileged to work at a company that sells Dask, we get to talk to lots of people who use Dask in industry. People, generally speaking, at least back in the day, attended meetups, you know, network, look for jobs, hire, stuff like that. Um, so the business focus, if you're in financial services, life science, and, and energy, although I'll change, I would broaden that to just geospatial in general, which includes a lot of climate science, um, mining, tons of fun things there. We see lots of Dask usage. So if you're interested in those industries or if you're in those industries, there's an overlap with Dask. Um, and then we'll, I'll try to demonstrate some of these so that you can see what I hope is like fundamental distributed Python concept. We're gonna apply that, we're gonna show you a Dask example and hopefully you'll say, oh gosh, that's like pretty easy. I don't have to worry about all that hard stuff. And then I'm gonna map that over to a few examples uh, for, some, to, for some industry specific stuff. And in particular, I'll, I'll be really explicit about a finance example. Um, because it uses open data, it's kind of the easiest to share. So that's those are objectives. Hopefully at the end of this, you kind of leave with this sense. Um, just as a quick disclaimer, uh, because we're recording the things, I kind of have to do this. I, I'm going to share these representative workloads. I'm not sharing private information from anyone I speak to or we have an NDA with, or I, you know, I speak to in a business context. If I use a company name, which I will try to, this is all from the community. Um, so we'll talk, for example, Capital One is a big user of Dask. They blog about it, they extend Dask, they do lots of cool stuff. I will share an example from them when relevant, um, but that's not implying uh, a commercial relationship of any kind or any private uh, data that I would be sharing. Okay, boring disclaimer over. Uh, big picture, most, oh, and, and just, uh, sorry, I, I'm gonna, I have a tendency to just plow through. So I will be checking the chat for questions and stuff if you wanna fire them out as we go. Um, I, I have a few spots where I'll try to come up for air, but if you don't stop me, I'm just gonna keep, I'm gonna keep rolling. Um, so let's start with a little bit of introduction around kind of the need for this, why someone might want to scale Python, what the heck we're doing here. So um, a couple of things that are obvious, but worth pointing out. Most kind of quantitative fields have two things, two trends going on. They have many, but these two are pretty solid. Data volumes going out the wazoo and lots of Python adoption. And so if, uh, if you are using Python, which you're more likely than not to do, or you're hiring people who will be using Python because they now teach this as you know, CS 101, and you're trying to deal with these large data volumes, you're going to run into some challenges and, and you might want some tools to help you solve that. Dask is one of those tools that helps scale Python to large data sets. Uh, and if you learn Dask, you can apply it to the existing Python code you have you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So we're gonna come in today and I'm gonna show you kind of two approaches, the Dask approach to your standard Pi data stack, the Dask version of an array, the Dask version of a data frame, but this is critical, you can also just Daskify your code and take whatever you're writing in Python and just go ahead and parallelize it. Now, there are some things that can get tricky, but you're, this is what Dask enables you to do, build arbitrary task graphs, which is really powerful and really fun. Um, okay, next. All right. Uh, so to put some data behind this, the data growth has exploded. You don't need me to tell you this. Um, here's a chart that shows the explosion in data. Just for full disclosure, I made this chart up. This isn't real. 
Um, but the actual, I mean, the date, this chart is wrong, but the, date, the, the trend is absolutely true. And I found a fun example uh, from the Wall Street, the Wall Street Journal of all places uh, a couple of weeks ago. They published these, these graphics to show data growth over time in areas that I wouldn't have expected. Uh, so for example, on the left here, this is Major League Baseball stat cast data. And they were using, they showed a, a number of these and I, I cherry picked two. And they used a, a grain of rice to try to show that I think a grain of rice was equal in data size to about a, to a single image, to a photograph. So snap a photo with your, uh, with, your, with your camera phone and then that would be one grain of rice. And so the ma Major League Baseball for the purposes of the team's analytics and then stuff I'm sure they sell to fans and others, they generate about five terabytes of stat cast data per game. 162 games in a season, plus add in playoffs, plus however many teams, they're generating a significant amount of data. Whereas previously, if you think about baseball historically, which I think is worth doing, you know, how did you track data in baseball? Well, they've always done that. You kept score. You know, I, I remember we used to keep score. We used to keep score by with a pen and paper and you draw, you know, and then it, anyway, like it's kind of wild that all of a sudden it went from this very manual process that people had done for a, a really long time to now all this additional data, that's in, that's the non-structured stuff. This is the images, this is the video, this is the players moving around, this is looking at mechanics, all sorts of things that previously didn't exist. Um, and then on the right over here is kind of the example that you'd expect, which is what YouTube, which has exploded. Uh, and I won't even cite the growth here because it's just kind of, it, it's, it boggles the mind and it's probably not your enterprise or corporate situation or your personal situation, but they're now up to something like five petabytes per day, which is kind of wild, 122 tons of rice. So if each baseball game is 235 pounds, every day of YouTube is 122 tons. That's pretty nuts. Um, and because I work for a vendor, I also kind of want to critique vendors for a second. Um, and there's a, another fun article from the New York Times uh, that I, and, and I also aim this for the Pi Data audience. Sometimes there are people in attendance, maybe not tonight, but sometimes there are people in attendance at Pi Data events who are new to Python uh, and new to programming in general. And I, I was an English major at school. I'm, I'm not even necessarily, I'm not even necessarily, I'm probably a bad programmer by any stretch, a bad coder. Uh, Python's one of those things that's very accessible. It's, I, I think that's why I like it. I, I hope that's why maybe others like it. Uh, but there's still people who are on the fence. And, and I'm surprised how many people I talk to these days who are like, I'm still thinking about it. And nothing wrong with that. It's good to be open, but please dive in. Um, and when I ask folks, like, why haven't you gotten into this yet? Like, what are you waiting for? One of the things they tend to say is like, well, I work at a big company and I think someone, I, I can use a, a tool that's going to do what I need to do. And so I found this article to, to really flesh this point out. And the author writes, by the time you become truly proficient at programming, chances are, that whatever you set out to write would be available in some form from a software publisher. This is really interesting. This is January's New York Times. Um, but of course, I'm being a little devious here. It was in January's New York Times, but I got the year wrong. It wasn't this year, it was written in 1984. And I think the, the subsequent quote, quote is actually really illustrative for us. And I'm assuming here in the audience that if you haven't learned Python yet, you're still working in this data space, right? Data volumes are going like crazy. Um, the people that you may that you may lead or manage are going to be learning this. Computers will become as common to this generation, this is 1980s, as television was to their parents. But the vast majority of parents do not repair television sets, write for television. I love this. Work in the broadcasting industry in any capacity. So if you take those three, you know, it's like don't learn. Uh, to write code back in the 80s because just like you might watch tv you don't repair the tv set or write for you're not in the show bit you're not in show business you don't work in broadcasting of course i would i pause it that that is absolutely not true for us that almost all of us uh, especially given this just the, especially or due to this large data growth are are absolutely working in the data industry or at least are adjacent to this it's quite common everybody has this problem we're all working in it Ergo, it's worth to learn. Now, I may be preaching to the choir here. This is a Pi Data Meetup. Everyone may be very proficient, but uh, if you know someone who's still on the fence, like maybe play a joke on them with something like this. Um, okay, so preamble over. Well, let's get into some code here. Let's get let's start. Or let's first talk Dask architecture and why you might use it. Um, more specifically, technical, and then we'll show some examples. Um, so first up, why use Dask? 
uh, there, this is the first question. I, oh, I want to scale Python or I want big data frames. There's lots of options for this. And we'll go through some of these, um, but principally Spark is probably the one that most people are familiar with. They'll say, well, if I have Python and I want to work with lots of data, I would use Spark. That's the standard. PySpark gives me a Python API. There are tools within the ecosystem like Koalas that would give me data frames and their familiar interfaces. What's the deal? Why would I want to bother with anything else? Well, the high level reasons. Dask number one has a familiar API. I'll direct your attention over here on the right. Note these three lines of code. Import pandas, read CSV, group by. When I do this in Dask, it's import pandas, import Dask data frame, excuse me, read CSV and group by. Now there are there is a slight difference that the astute reader will note this dot compute will get there, uh, but it is very, very similar. The API is very similar. Second, you can use Dask on your laptop or on a cluster. This reason is near and dear to me, which is why I titled this talk to the cluster and back. We're gonna, we're gonna show this today. Uh, this one I think is really, really important, especially for people who work in corporate environments where things get really locked down. And you might find yourself in the, instant, in the case of someone trying to use Spark, kind of forced onto what might be referred to as an edge node or a gateway node or something where I have to be in this area with these binaries and all of this configuration already set up so that I can then just do something like, probably not read a CSV, but read a parquet file or something like that and do some processing. Um, so that's reason two, familiar API, scale laptop, cluster, and back. Uh, reason three, Dask integrates with the PyData ecosystem. This is because Dask is pure Python. It's a Python native package. So not just pandas and NumPy and scikit-learn, but also the rest of what's in what's in Python and PyData. We can, if you use Dask, you can scale arbitrary Python code, which is really really powerful. You know, Python gets this bad this bad rap, fair or unfair, for being slow and not scaling well. But with something like Dask, we can maybe still be slow, but we'll be faster if we're distributed. Uh, which makes something that's easy to use now scalable. Um, and that feeds into bullet number four, which is Dask supports complex applications. So you've noticed this, maybe you're annoyed by this kind of GIF over here on the right. This is a more complicated task graph. I'll step through an example like this at a bit of a high level, uh, but you can build really complex tasks or really complex uh, parallel, parallel code, I'm struggling for the word here, jobs, with Dask, you can do it really easily. In fact, this will actually be our first example of code. Um, and then the final thing in one of the favorite features for people who are Dask users is the, the real-time diagnostics, the Dask dashboard, uh, which gives us a lot of rich information about what Dask is doing. It's not perfect by any stretch, but it's a, it's a heck of a lot nicer than looking at a bunch of Java stack traces or maybe being in, in uh, Grafana or some things you're trying to parse out what's going on with your Spark code. And not to keep throwing shade at Spark, but there'll be a few more jabs throughout the throughout the evening. Um, and just to ram this point home about a laptop to cluster and back, uh, the this I think is a critical thing when I think about a standard developer workflow. Now, if you're if you're kind of saddled or burdened or you're forced to work with these large data sets, you're almost always going to do some sort of sampling to work locally, right? You're going to develop on your laptop or your maybe maybe instead of laptop, this is in fact a big server or something like that. But you're going to have uh, you're going to have some sort of environment where you can quickly hack on stuff. So if you want to use Dask here, it's great. It's pip install Dask and distributed, and then import them and run. Same thing on a big server. So what I'll show here in a bit is Dask scaling really nicely vertically. So that by that I mean if this laptop has four cores and 16 gigs of RAM, and Pandas uses just a single core, which is what it does. When I use a Dask data frame, I'll get to four cores. I move over to a big server and AWS, Azure, GCP, they'll give me huge servers. I can get one with 100 cores or 96 cores. I can scale all the way up to those. I don't have to worry about networking and all the sorts of things that come when I go to a cluster. So I can get, a, I can squeeze a lot of juice out of one of these big servers. And most importantly, it's the exact same code. Import Dask, import distributed, go forth. And then what I posit to you is that when you go to a cluster, now there's gonna be some more mechanics here and I'll show some examples at the very end of the talk. This infrastructure won't be our focus, but when we go to a cluster, we're gonna do the exact same thing, import task, import distributed. We'll have a cluster object we're gonna to need to have created some way, somehow, but once we pass that in, all of our code remains the same. This is way, way different in my opinion, um, 
but this is way, way different from how you might work with Spark or other tools, especially for getting Spark, things like, uh, you know, if you used to write MPI, or if you're working in HPC systems, uh, your code is going to be very different. This is not the case. You know, I'm hand waving a little bit to be clear, but I, I consider this to be one of the strongest value propositions of Dask. Prototype, develop, deploy, you know, small, medium, large, you're, lar you're essentially passing the same code. Um, now, to be fair, I think when I describe, so that's why to use Dask, let's talk about why not to use it. And so these come, by the way, directly from the Dask docs. These are the best practices when not to use Dask, let's be explicit. Uh, first up, if you have the opportunity to use better algorithms or data structures, simply moving from something like CSV to Parquet, or if you can, if you can chunk your data, you may find that you're able to get the performance you need. Uh, it will see some, I'll show examples of bad algorithms. I don't know if I have examples of good ones, but obviously, but as you grow in competence and, and your understanding of the problem and your ability to wield Python or your language, you, you can improve performance without using Dask. Um, ah, better file formats are kind of, I already shared that. Part, a big one for most, for a lot of users is going to something like Parquet from CSV, uh, which is more efficient. Um, step three, compile. So another num focus sponsored project that is near and dear to people who are at Anaconda is Numba uh, as an example. So uh, Python, um, if you would like to compile your code so that this way, uh, depending on how this is done, of course it can vary, but a compilation step would make Python run a lot faster. And there are tools that do this. Uh, one in particular that I like is called Numba. It has a just-in-time compiler, JIT compiler. And this will this will drastically increase the speed of your code. Now there is a compilation step; you're not running it interpreted, but it it works very nicely. Um, the fourth one, this one's kind of obvious but important: sample. Just create a representative sample of your data. That way, you don't need to distribute because you don't have big data. You have data that fits in memory or fits comfortably in memory with pandas. And the fifth one is profile. Uh, Ian Oswald, who wrote this book called High Performance Python. Uh, and speaks at a lot of PyData and, and Python events, is uh, a master of this. And it's something I understand very poorly, but I have a copy of his book and I'd recommend watching one of his talks because he does a great job, oops, excuse me, of showing you kind of how to squeeze all the juice out of your code and how to profile. Of course, Dask has a profile or two, so which you'll get to see. All right, excellent. Um, I, in the interest of time here, I've taken too much on this intro. Let's, let's get into some code and uh, jump over. Oops, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to stop sharing. I'm sorry. Uh, let me. Oh gosh, what did I do? Sorry, I'll share back again. We'll share everything. Okay, this is GCP, but I want to share my slides. All right, there we go. Uh, just as a quick check. I hope if anyone's still there, I don't know. Uh, I'm showing a Jupyter Notebook right now and it should be kind of zoomed in how most start with Dask. Can anybody see that? Or am I on like my Slack or personal email embarrassing myself? We can yes. see that. Perfect. Okay, great. So let's uh, let's jump in here and let's get rid of both marks. So um, we're gonna start with some Dask examples. So here's how most people come to Dask with either, they're either coming from a NumPy array or a DAS data frame. As data frames are more popular, I'm going to start with um, with an array just to show an example. So we'll create a, a, the DAS version of this, and we will quickly visualize what our array looks like. So I just created this empty array here, and I've got this single array, a single task. This is exactly what you'd have with NumPy, and in fact, all DAS does with DAS arrays, or not, maybe not all it does, but at its core, a DAS array is a collection of NumPy arrays. A Dask data frame is a collection of Pandas data frames. Um, we want to parallelize things, and Dask will do a lot of smart stuff to help us figure this out, but we can manually split this up here into chunks so that we can start to get some parallelism. So same thing. And, and by the way, this is meant to be a quick, right? We're gonna we're gonna go faster, just try to build intuition. It's not like all this code and anything I show is gonna be in docs and examples on the Dask site. And I'll, I'll show you where all that is. Um, but here we go. So now we've got three, we've got this array, we've chunked it into three chunks of five, and we can start to run operations in parallel. So I just ran here very quickly, a sum operation. And uh, while it wouldn't, this because this data is small, you wouldn't necessarily have noticed, but Dask built a task graph here that shows these three independent sum operations that it will run. 
So instead of running, okay, take the array and sum the array as one task, it did it as three tasks. We're starting to get some parallelism. Um, now, what's really interesting here, and actually, let's just make sure I should be able to check here. If I run Y, when I look at my result here, what's interesting is all I see is this representation. Dask is actually lazily uh, computed. So I need to compute this to get the result. This is when my code actually executes. Otherwise, Dask is just building a task graph. So this, this is a very powerful concept and I'm, I'm probably doing a poor job here of explaining it. But basically what I'm hoping to show is that when we ran an operation like sum this array, I would have expected an answer back, you know, give me, give me the answer. Instead, I get back uh, either a visualization, this is the actual task graph and, and, and what this looks like. This is, this is the shape of the arrays, these are the chunks, these are the data types. And then I need to explicitly call compute to tell task, okay, execute this and return the result to my local machine or in this, excuse me, return the result to my client, which in this case just happens to be my local machine. Um, not to scare anyone, but one of the, like a fun way to kind of blow up your local machine, I mean, not that it would be irrecoverable, uh, but it's to call compute when the data that you're returning is not say like a single, like a float, but a monstrous array or a huge data frame, you will then dash will then try to serialize this and bring it back to you from the cluster. Um, but anyway, so that's our first little quick intro. Let's do something a little bit more fun. So let's build a, a more complex array. So now we've got a series of three of those same arrays and we're still summing them along the, along the zeroth axis. And so now we can see a more complex task graph. Now, again, this, the code didn't become appreciably more complex. I'm still just running this one operation. Uh, let's go ahead and I'm gonna keep running visual, visualizing these next few steps. Let's add what we just created this array. Let's add it to add it to its transpose. So in this case, DASP took this operation X, X plus its transpose. And we got this slightly more complex graph. We didn't have to build this ourselves. This is what Dask is doing for us automatically. This is this is the kind of core Dask algorithm at work. And I'm going to have a little bit more fun here. So let's make this more complicated. Let's add in a matrix multiply, and we're going to make this graph even more complicated. Now again, uh, or not again, but you could build all of this manually. You don't necessarily need to use Dask to do it. There are other options, but even within Dask, you could manually build a task graph. In Dask, it's represented as a key value, or as a series of, of keys and values, as a dict. You could write this out if you wanted to, but kind of the nice, the wonder, the majesty here of Dask is it does it for you. All right, and we're gonna keep going here. Final one is let's add in a matrix multiply and a mean, and we'll visualize all of this. And here's what our task graph looks like now. So hopefully what the idea here being, there's a lot of complexity uh, when it comes to running stuff in parallel. Dask will do a lot of this work for you so that you can write code that looks like standard Python PyData code. That's the core idea of what's going on here. And I'll, I'll jump over to documentation here for a second, but the Dask docs run through all of this stuff. And you can see this at docs.dask.org. And you can, you can look at the structure, but also a ton of fun examples on how to set all of this up for NumPy style arrays, Dask arrays as well as for data frames. And these, uh, I won't jump to spend too much time on data frames, um, but you're gonna see something that looks very similar, just like the, uh, the NumPy example. And I will check quickly. Okay, great, we're still rolling. So uh, with this kind of quick, okay, high level interface in mind, let's go to the other direction. And let's say I, you, you, it's like Gus, you told me, hey, Dask can parallelize. Dask gives me big data frames, big arrays, big scikit-learn style estimators. Wonderful, but it can also parallelize arbitrary Python code. Let's do that now. So, right here, I have three functions: increment, double, and add. And I've got a small set of data. And we have a little for loop here where we're going to go through in serial operation: increment, double, and add. And I'll just go ahead and run that right now. Now, this will run quickly. We could slow it down by adding in like importing time.sleep and putting it in here, but I won't do that for the moment. I just want to show you what this would look like when we, we parallelize this with Dask. So same code, same exact for loop. Let's run this with Dask. And the way we'll do this is we're gonna build a task graph and we're gonna use an interface called Dask Delayed. Dask has two principal lower level collections. 
delayed, and futures. And delayed will build a task graph that we can then specify when we'd like to execute. And I can, I can append or I can add to my code this existing for loop, ink, double, and add by just wrapping it with das.delayed. There's also a decorator here, which is another way you'll see this. that will just be really explicit, das.delayed. And so now we can run this and we can visualize what Dask is doing. And so what Dask did here was it, it looked at our code, it looked at those three functions and it said, okay, there's a for loop. Which of these can I run in parallel and which are dependent on the others? And it figured this out. And like, maybe this isn't that complicated, but I think this is pretty cool. And maybe that says more about me, I don't know. But take a look at this. We're gonna look at these functions in a little bit of depth here. So, the first one increment takes as an argument X, which is what we're looping through. And then the second one, double, takes as an, as an argument X as well. And this is no different from the code here. They're just the function and the function's argument are arguments to delayed, which may sound a little tricky, but it, delayed takes in two arguments, the function double, and then what it that function took as an argument. So, Das looked at these and said, oh gosh, I can execute these in parallel because they're not dependent upon each other. But add, it needs the result of A and B to be to be computed before or to be to be computed before it can it can compute itself. So thus it constructs this graph and figures it out, which is pretty handy. And what I'll we'll show in our kind of subsequent examples is where this kind we can take this kind of um, this behavior, we can apply more complex stuff than increment, double, and add, and we can get some pretty good scaling behavior without having to really understand a ton about what we would want to distribute and why. All right. Um, oh, and the documentation for delayed and futures is also here in the DAS docs. And you can see, oh gosh, you can, uh, I blatantly stole this example right from the first, you know, right from the front page, uh, but it's in here. You can take a look at these, ink, double, and add. All right, so let's jump back quickly uh, to slides. And I wanna spend a second on the finance use case. I hope this is okay. Um, if anyone has, maybe I could, I, I could pause for a second how, how we're doing. We're about halfway, we're about halfway through on time. Um, I've got a number of use cases to show. Well, these will be one code heavy example for finance. The others will be higher level if you're, if you're already bored. Hopefully that will be more fun. And then I'll talk a little bit about different ways you can deploy Dask on clusters like Kubernetes and all these fun open source options. Um, okay, no one's complaining, we'll go forth. All right, uh, let me go back into slideshow mode. So uh, in financial services, which is a huge umbrella term, of course, uh, there's, lots, there's lots of pandas and spreadsheets, and of, therefore, ergo, there is lots of Dask. We see Dask used a lot in bag testing and simulation, risk modeling, and you know what's the whole in these end-to-end -end ML workflows that have everyone so hot and bothered. Um, but you won't hear any preening from me about that, or at least not much. Um, the data formats we tend to see, no surprise, NumPy and Pandas. This is a spreadsheet time series driven world. And one thing that I think is interesting to note are the professions. Uh, you kind of heard my anti-data science bias, but you'll often see people here who are quants or researchers, and then of course engineers versus maybe your your uh, uh, your data scientists of today. And then interestingly, just as an infrastructure note, we see lots of on-premises uh, computing, which makes sense. Um, some cloud, and then some HPC, which can be both uh, on-prem and uh, in the cloud. All right, um, we the reason uh, on most of these workflows that we see, in, especially in financial services, but this is broader across other industries, are embarrassingly parallel tasks. And this graphic here on the right is the one that we saw previously. So instead of ink and double, it could be things like, okay, we're just going to read data in parallel from a gigantic object store or file storage, and then we're going to run some simulations on it. We're going to do like a Monte Carlo simulation or something like that, where we can run a bunch of these in parallel and we're, we're simply compute bound. Um, then there are also more complex tasks. And actually, I think in the order of my slides, I'm gonna show you, uh, let me show you one of these examples before we go further into this. So let's jump up here. I'm gonna import Dask. And uh, critically here, I'm also going to import from Dask distributed uh, the client, and I'm gonna create a local cluster here. 
And this local cluster concept is, is pretty important. Um, and I say pretty important, that, that sounds, that's very weak. Let me pull this over here to the right so that we can see it as we run. Hopefully this isn't too smushed. This may be a little smushed, I apologize. Um, let's go back to simple interface view. Okay, great. So Dask, Dask has two methods of running. Uh, you can run with import, as we saw the first time, uh, Dask Array, the, lo the local scheduler. Um, I imported Dask Array and I just used it. Uh, there was nothing else. You could do the same thing with Dask Data Frame, go forth uh, and parallelize. There's another option, which is the distributed scheduler. And somewhat confusingly, we're gonna run the distributed scheduler here on my local machine, this is a local host. Uh, but what this does, it does a number, a couple of things. Most importantly, it gives me access to this Dask dashboard. So it shows me, for example, that uh, maybe very dangerously, I'm, I'm letting Dask use all, all of my uh, logical cores and all of my memory, even though I'm also running Zoom and Chrome, which is a, little, which is a lot. Uh, and I can look here and see, okay, the scheduler is running here and here are each of my workers. Now, the nice thing about this or why this is really important, one is to profile, but two, this is how you would also then, is, this is one of the key steps to then pushing out to a cluster. In the future, what we'll do is we'll pass in a cluster object explicitly to this client. At the moment, uh, without specifying an argument, Dask will create a local cluster and say, okay, we're using a local cluster here. I will automatically instantiate it. Um, but in, in the future, we'll then say, we'll explicitly create a cluster, my Kubernetes cluster, my Dask on HPC cluster, my Dask on a big VM over there, Dask on coiled as an option, and then I can use my existing code. Um, also, I'll show you, Gosh, I better speed up. Uh, we could do this exact same thing with GPUs, which is really cool. Uh, we can use, if you have multiple GPU cards on either your machine or on a big VM, you can use Dask to parallelize across, uh, to distribute, excuse me, across all of those, those GPU cards, which are really good at parallelization. Um, so let's, let me show this quickly. Um, so, and I'm not a finance guy, uh, but I got this from the Python for Finance uh, book, which is a great one by, um, Eves Hilfish. And so we're going to do a uh, European call option simulation, strike price, time to maturity. And I've got, you know, I've got this function set out and I can go ahead and run it one time and I get back the value of this option. Great. Now, I, I this is a bad finance example, but I'm trying to keep it something clean enough for, for us. Let's say that any one of these parameters, we would like to we would like to do a simulation with a list of these. And I'm just going to use a list of a, a handful of, of these. But as you can imagine, we see often is it's like, hey, I, I wanted I, what's the price of this option in the event of X Y Z? Except instead of X Y Z, it's 16 billion different combinations of things. I just want to keep simulating across any world event. You know, if if Russia invades Ukraine, how does that affect you know if the Timberwolves beat the whomever? Like all of that sorts of stuff. And so this is my maybe quick attempt here to, uh, to model this. And principally, I'm not claiming this is good DAS code. I'm just saying that it works. All I do is take my existing function here and I'm gonna run a little for loop. I'm gonna loop over this element. This could be a DAS array that I'm, I'm gonna, you know, or a DAS data frame where I'm gonna apply something. It could be a bunch of stuff, but I'm gonna do that exact same DAS delayed option. And when I run this now, oh gosh. Oh, I didn't report this. No, how embarrassing. There we go. I get back these delayed objects and I, I can visualize these individually and see that basically each one of these is my task. I, I, I mentioned this again, not because this is clever, but because it's the opposite. This is like a real brute force approach. All I did was say, okay, I'm gonna iterate through this list, but I want Dask to blow that. I want Dask to run each one of these operations in parallel if it can. And then I'll run it over a cluster later on if I need to, if it's not running as fast as I want. Instead of going back to that, like Dask, when not to use Dask, instead of profiling, instead of sample, instead of optimizing, instead of compiling, I just can be lazy and do this, right? And you can too. Um, and so now we can go ahead and run this and we can visualize our tasks here. And we can actually run compute. And there finally we see the tasks executed on the right. These are the tasks across our cores. And I get back my result here and I can, I can total this up. And you'll see the red shows the, uh, network serialization here as we're, we're pulling back some data. So uh, this was my kind of like 
ugly but hopefully meaningful example for people who have existing Python, uh, existing Python code in their domain, you can start to parallelize and distribute this um, with Dask. And oh gosh, uh, let me close this out now. I'll make this big again. And I'll go ahead and restart this kernel so I don't overwhelm my local machine. Um, I am loath to go back to slides at the moment. Uh, instead, actually, I want to show you one more uh, example that has to do with, uh, with Dask and notebooks. And that's going to be over here. Um, again, no, no complaints. I appreciate no, no one's stopping me. So I'm, I'm taking that as a sign of encouragement. Um, I've been running everything so far on my local machine. Dask works really well. I mentioned in that, in that graphic, it's like local machine or big server and then cluster. So let's, let's pick the middle option. Let's go big server. And I'm, I'm inside of uh, Google, Cloud, Google Cloud platform here. Uh, and their Jupyter Notebook service is called Vertex AI. I don't know why it's called that. Uh, but it's similar to Amazon AWS SageMaker. It's just cheaper. And so what I have here is actually a relatively modest machine for vCPUs and 15 gigs of RAM. But I've got a little Tesla T4 GPU, which is like a nice mixture of economy and performance. So I'm, I'm calling this because, you know, it's my credit card on this account. I'm calling this my big server for the purposes of our demo. And so I can open up Jupyter Lab and I can now use Dask within this, which is really, really nice. So uh, when I have a GPU, or sorry, as a, just a brief intro to the, to the GPU side of the house, uh, there are GPU enabled are there GPU libraries for doing stuff with data frames and arrays? And thanks to the good folks at NVIDIA, in particular, those on the, a team called the Rapids team. Actually, let me make sure the, the Rapids docs are up. So if you if you have a GPU or if you're interested, um, Rapids is an open source package that solves the nasty problem of trying to figure out versions with particular CUDA drivers, the underlying driver that's needed to work with the GPU. Um, so very, very helpful. They tell you, install this. If you have this, you can pick and choose and it'll tell you exactly what to use, which is super, super nice. Uh, and this integrates CUDA, excuse me, and Rapids integrate nicely with Dask. So if I want a data frame and I want to use my data frame uh, with, or I, want, I have a GPU and I want to do data frame stuff on the GPU, I can install one of those, those environments and I can use something called QDF, CUDA data frame. And I can run a little data frame operation here. I'm going to read from S3. It's this uh, New York taxi data set that is kind of the hello world of big data, even actually, although I just have one of them. Um, you may be a little bit sick of it. And I go ahead and do a group by and, and grab a column and, and do the mean so we can see the average tip by passenger count, which should look just like Panda's code. Uh, let's do the, oh, I don't have simple interface here. I'm, I'm sorry you're seeing it. Let me at least get this out of the way. Uh, uh, sorry little... to interrupt. This is so exciting, but oh, no. uh, I can't believe that, you know, it's almost time. We usually have a 45 minute talk. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, then, um, yeah, yeah uh, your local CUDA cluster, this will let you use Dask, and you can do this across your, your whole machine. Um, I will go back then if I can wrap to conclude. Uh, if you like this, you can use Dask across a lot of different places. It's used in a lot of different industries. Um, you can deploy Dask on a cluster in a bunch of different ways. Maybe I'll just highlight this. Single machine, HPC, cloud, Dask platforms. If you have a team of people, the open source option you probably like is called Dask Gateway. If you don't want to mess with this yourself, I, I work in sales, account executive for a company called Coil. We provide Dask clusters as a service. Email me and I will give you free credits. Uh, and if you have DAS problems, you can email me too because most of the DAS maintainers work with us. We can try to fix them. Uh, thanks so much. <laughs> I'm sorry for running it over. Um, I'll stop sharing here. And if you guys have, I apologize. I, I, I thought I had the floor. Oh, it's really good. I totally forgot about time. Um, maybe we could um, ask Gus to take one question from the audience. Any questions? So um, I, I have one. If there's no 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 question from from the I, I have questions for myself too. If unless you actually have a genuine one, I, no. But I mean, like ones that are commonly asked. I'm happy to ask a, a question or two if that if that'd be helpful. So do you want to answer your own question or? <laughs> sure, sure, yeah, uh, absolutely. Oh wait, we did get one in the chat. Let me see if I can answer. Yeah. Um, 
Right. Can you show how multi-column sorting of data frame works? Ooh, that terrifies me. Um, so actually, so someone asked, Evan asked a great question, which is like, hey, can you show something in Pandas uh, that, that should work? And I, I suspect maybe Evan, if you've tried this with Dask and it didn't work exactly as you expected, there are some gaps here. Uh, and in fact, I didn't even get into one of my kind of favorite examples here for where Dask cannot work. Um, but let me jump over here. I don't know if my cluster is still running, but there are a host of areas where you're gonna see differences in, especially in the data frame API, like dash data frame dot head will always work. Dash data frame dot tail may not because we, Dask, uh, we don't, it's as lazy. It can't see if it, presuming it's a huge data frame, it's simplest answer, like what those data types are, what constitutes the end. Um, it, it can cause problems. That, that was a poor rushed explanation, but in the event that you have questions, this is new and not a lot of people know about it, but there is a discourse for Dask. So if you have usage questions like, why the heck isn't this thing doing what it's supposed to be doing? Come here, come to Dask data frame, post your question. Uh, at Coiled, a number of the Dask engineers, they have OKRs, so you know, it's part of their, they're evaluated on how quickly and how well they answer questions here. I'm gonna think that I can share that. So go ahead and post, you'll get really good support from people who know Dask really, really well. Um, and if nobody answers you, send me an email, Gus at cold.io, and I can I can tap them um, to Evan's question. So if if uh, assuming that doesn't work exactly as you would expect, Evan. Um, and if I have time, uh, I'll go ahead and ask my own question, uh, which was going to be uh, do you, for DAS deployment in the cloud, or if I want more DAS examples, where can I find them? Examples.dask.org. This will take you through the different interface or the collections but also show you end-to-end -end examples, stuff that you can run all with binder links, which is really, really nice. Uh, and then the second thing is, if you had to ask me, what's your favorite way to deploy Dask, not using Coiled, the thing that I sell, it would be Dask Gateway is what we see most often. And I'll just quickly show you a little diagram here, uh, which we, you'll stand up a gateway server so that now you can have multi-tenant, uh, individual users should come in and spin up clusters. You can put control around it. It's a really great project. Again, free as in free beer, open source. And if you don't like that, you can chunk, come check out Coiled, but this is a really cool project. Oh, truly really fantastic talk. Thank you, Gus. I feel energized by your, um, you know, um, talk and uh, I hope you would let us invite you back sometime in the near future. Thank you so much for having me. This is really a pleasure. Um, I'm so, Maybe I'm one of the few who laments that we, I, I'm sure others lament we can't do this in person, um, but I, I certainly do. I don't live in Chicago though, so I wouldn't be there otherwise other than North Carolina. So, th you know, thanks for the, the remote, I appreciate. Um, well, very lucky for us. Okay, thank you all. Um, <laughs> bye for now. Bye for now, have a good night. Good night.